Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of video responses to patron requests within the School for Bin Text by moving on today to a discussion of Lusby of Rudolf Steiner, particularly in this video. We'll be doing a full book overview of the incarnation of Ariman, but in addition to examining the contents of the book itself, we'll also have an in-depth discussion of the patron's question um, with regard to this book and the problem of modern technology, the other themes of the school itself. And for that, I really do encourage all of you to join in with this discussion, especially those within the school itself on the Discord. Remember, you can join us at the school for just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. Also begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. The purpose of this video is neither to promote nor refute any theories contained within the book, but rather to examine them from a strictly philosophical perspective. So before we get into the text itself, I think it's important to actually begin with the patron's question and to keep this in mind as we go through um, Steiner's presentation of the argument. And of course, we'll return to the question at the end of the video. The question is, hey, Chad, I got a new book for you to check out when you have time. The Incarnation of Ariman, The Embodiment of Evil on Earth, which is seven lectures given between October and December of 1919. I just started it myself, but basically Ariman is the spirit spiritual equivalent of modern technology and is the consciousness that replaces human subjectivity as it recedes into technique. Steiner was himself a clairvoyant who predicted that stone or spider-like beings would dominate the earth with information. The project of industrial elites is to prepare um, his body, that is our bodies minus our subjectivity plus the physical industrial system, for the full incarnation of Ariman himself. So this is a very fascinating question, which um, of course deserves much more treatment. But before we can um, get into that, we'll go ahead and examine the arguments of um, Steiner himself, starting with the first lecture, which was given on November 21st, 1919. So Steiner opens the lecture series by reminding his listeners that any serious study of spiritual influences will inevitably be incomplete if it does not study both Luciferic and Ariamonic forces. Yet this is basically what we do when we treat the human person as a dualism of body and soul rather than a trilogy of body, soul, and spirit. Contrary to expectation, the latter is not some unfounded new invention from, say, Steiner himself, but is actually an established doctrine with a very long history in the world of tradition. In fact, this had to be forcefully suppressed by church councils, such as in um, 869 AD. For example, we can consider the Luciferic forces to be the uh, one-sided fantasies, as he says himself, which drive uh, one to let oneself be carried away by something else, which makes one lose one's head. In contrast, he says, think of everything that presses us down upon the earth and makes us dull and philistine, leading us to develop materialistic attitudes, penetrating us with a dry intellect, and so on. There you have a picture of the Aramonic powers. The human person actually, by default occupies a position caught between these two tendencies, uh, one of course driving us to the spiritual equivalent of the inward density of the bones, and the other driving us to the outgoing expansion of the blood to use Steiner's own metaphors. Being driven too far in either direction, it bears mentioning, results in pathological behavior, as the Luciferic drive outward eventually devolves into baseless hallucination, while the Ariamonic drive inward creates an apathetic and lethargic senile state which is all too familiar in, say, old age. In his own terms, blood represents the Luciferic, while bones represent the Ariamonic. The human person might be thought of as, in essence, just the balance between these two opposing forces. While the Luciferian beings tempt us to dishonor and cut ties with the Creator, the Ariamonic beings instead seek to bring humans under total control in much the same way that the technological system's ever finer grades of domination had been described as quite literally demonic by various occultists like, say, Julius Evola. While the Luciferian tendency is towards a type of perverse freedom from any higher authority, the Ariamonic tendency is towards a domination that is actually antithetical to the former. Likewise, our account of the cosmos will only 
be complete if it incorporates luciferic, aromatic, and human elements instead of acknowledging only two, let alone only one of these. For this reason, the suppression of the secret number three is actually an interest of both of these former forces in the quest for uh, supremacy within this hierarchy. So you know that the greatest irony about this is that any failure to recognize the three elements in favor of only recognizing two at the most will inevitably lead one to mistakenly describe heaven and the good with the terminology which actually is more fitting to the Luciferian, while limiting one's description of hell and the evil to the one-sided terminology of the Arimanic. Only if we have that established can we appreciate why Milton's Paradise Lost is really the story of of mankind's expulsion from the realm of the kind of luciferic freedom which um, Adam and Eve had experienced before they committed the first sin to, of course, um, the realm of Arimonic domination, which is mistakenly attributed to um, Lucifer himself. Once again, only a proper appreciation of the balance between the two will allow one to escape this trap of falling for the extremes. Under this view, the tendencies of the Christ impulse are not the opposite pull from evil, but is instead the proper balance of the third element lying between these two. Steiner then goes on to open the second lecture by claiming that a great part of mankind today is already under the sway in one way or another of universal Arimanic forces which are continually gaining in strength. So much more the case perhaps today a century after he said these words. Ironically, the same 20th century, which was supposed to be defined by a Luciferian liberation from traditional constraints, was actually just the Arimanic enslavement unlike any other in history. In contrast, it was the ancient world, Steiner tells us, which was defined by the literal incarnation of Luciferian wisdom in human form. That is to say, Lucifer actually was incarnated supposedly in ancient China in much the same way that Christ was incarnated in um, the Middle East some thousands of years after that fact. Steiner claims that this incarnation provided the inspiration and energy for the great accomplishments of Egyptian, Babylonian, and Greek civilizations. A word of warning, though, is warranted. Calling these Luciferian does not necessarily mean calling them evil, let alone arguing that one should throw away all the greatness evidenced in them. It's simply a spiritual description of their origin, which is virtually never acknowledged for what it really was. That's what Steiner's actually trying to accomplish here. Indeed, the Luciferian impulse actually found its most purified ancient expression within Christianity itself, though admittedly in the early heresy of Gnosticism, which, as you might recall, explicitly focused on a certain liberation which promised to take one so far beyond matter as to escape it altogether in favor of some higher spiritual realm. However, we must still emphasize the unique character of the event of the life of Jesus himself for at this point, an entirely different impulse that entered into the evolution of civilized humanity, proceeding, of course, from the figure of Christ himself. Ironically, Steiner tells us, Christ influenced those who had already fallen under the influence of the Luciferian, which was established much earlier, so it actually is not an exaggeration to say that in the earliest centuries of Christianity, people largely interpreted Christ through the Luciferian lens, but this statement is not nearly as offensive as it might appear to be, so long as one grasps it without any pre-given modern prejudices, for only then can one realize why Christianity grew weaker, precisely as the Luciferian impulse lost power over time, of course, uh, ending in the catastrophe of the Arimonic modernity. In short, as time passed, even Christian theology, theology itself became ever more materialistic. This is a statement and an observation which Steiner made a century before Pope Francis basically became nothing more than another college student protester SJW trying to please uh, wealthy liberal elites within the media more than actually carrying out anything like the original mission of Christ, even understood within the Steiner um, in perspective.
Steiner noted that as Jesus came to be seen more and more over time as nothing more than just another man, and the goal for the Christian came to be rising up to his level, but only through acquiring a better understanding on a purely intellectual level, um, the materialistic forces ironically distorted Christianity's true original essence precisely through making it less Luciferian. Not coincidentally, modernity, therefore, is characterized by the constantly growing influence of the Arimonic. Just as there was a Luciferian incarnation in ancient China and a Christly incarnation in the Near East two millennia ago, he warns that an Arimonic incarnation is, in fact, due sometime in the third millennium AD. This is, of course, really scary because, as he says himself, Ariman is the power that makes people dry, prosaic, philistine, that ossifies them and anchors them in the superstition of pure materialism. One sign of this ongoing degradation to our harmonic forces can be found in the way that we approach the cosmos itself. An ancient Egyptian, for example, felt himself to be made of the same stuff found up in the heavens because he knew that he was an integral part of the whole cosmos. But modern man ironically gained a better physical look at the universe with, say, telescopes and the resources of modern science, but um, drained it of its significance by reducing it to nothing more than a giant mechanistic object only to be understood through mathematical formalization, which precludes in advance any acknowledgement of its spiritual significance, let alone its shared spiritual nature with man. It should not come as so great a surprise, then, that Steiner refuses to call the discoveries even of, say, Galileo as absolute truth, for the whole point of modern science is to shift away from the spiritual absolutes of tradition to, as Guénon and Evola tell us, the numerical figures which are only ever at best approximations and for that very reason are constantly being replaced by other approximations. One also misses the point about, say, pre-Copernican astronomy if one simply treats it as just another primitive attempt to do the same kind of approximations, which obviously are done much better with the resources of modern science, while ignoring the spiritual value which it primarily held within that time. This, however, is exactly what the Aramonic forces favor, the self-contradictory belief that mathematical approximations are absolute truth, which only, of course, blocks out the traditional insight that such a formulation is that could only ever be at best an illusion masquerading as the truth. On a deeper level, these fail because they capture only one particular side of what is actually a multifaceted reality. This is not at all to say, of course, that one should reject modern science, but simply that one should recognize it for what it really is, a partial perspective on a much more complex phenomenon. On a political level, another method which Ariman uses to continue the decline of humans is to stir up the most primitive of all emotions and break people up into irrational and ever smaller groups. Ironically, the SJWs of today who claim to be committed to erasing all archaic social fetishisms are the ones who are themselves the most obsessed with this Ariamonic project of categorizing people into ever smaller niches of intersectional identity, such that it's no longer good enough to be just one type. You have to be as many in combination as possible, whether you actually are that or not. Just consider the case of Sean King, who gets to be whatever race he wants to be so he can have more categories of intersectional disenfranchisement to make more money, just the same as Elizabeth Warren didn't have to really be Native American to really be Native American by the standards of the uh, liberal media. Just consider also Jesse Smollett's insistence that he had to be paid reparations for a non-existent hate crime just because he's both LGB and non-white at the same time by his own um, description. Therefore, he deserves more ransom money, supposedly, than someone who would have only one such category of intersectionality. This manufactured conflict is, however, something which had to have arisen from properly demonic forces because it really doesn't have any origin within human nature itself and actively contradicts it. This only makes sense when you realize that the doctrine of materialistic 
reductivism makes such social conflict inevitable, for the sophistry of mathematical formalization can very well be used to prove both a thesis and its antithesis, as was the case with, of course, Marxist theory, which openly celebrated this. No wonder, then, that the conflict goes on and on, even if both sides claim to have some definitive proof that they are right and the other is wrong. Because anything can theoretically be proved, the only way out of this mess is to realize that the highest knowledge is that which goes beyond the very methodology of needing proofs. Steiner noted that the very worst form of this degradation is to be found in the way that the actual ruling class in modernity, contrary to what one might say, is that of the economist, such that even presidents and prime ministers are understood to be in the service of the mandates of the professional economist rather than the other way around. It really is, though, a historical anomaly in modernity for the mindset of bankers to take over the entire economy and reform it into no Nothing more than a system in which the financial industry takes over the whole and forces every other sphere of productivity to be subordinate to its own perverted ends. Does this mean, though, that one should have a nostalgic retreat back into, say, a literal interpretation of the Bible and the Bible alone? No, says Steiner, for that too would miss the point that the solution lies in the balance between the two poles rather than in limiting oneself to either of these two extremes. In the third lecture, Steiner noted that one might very well argue that before the rise of the ancient Hebrew culture, every religion was by default some form of paganism. But what can we really say of this paganism beyond the um, stereotypes and caricatures which actually don't get very close to the phenomenon itself? Well, the interesting thing which is unearthed through an unbiased examination of paganism is that although it contains many profound intellectual insights into the universe, it really does not contain any moral impulses to guide human action as such. Steiner argues that this is precisely because that was not necessary at a time when the pagan wisdom itself allowed one to feel fully incorporated into the cosmos. Ancient man understood himself to be made of the same physical substance as, of course, the plants and animals on the earth, but also to be composed of the same forces at work in the movement of the sun and stars above. Naturally, ethics followed from that basic metaphysical presupposition in much the same way that Spinoza tried to artificially reconstruct through his own uh, bizarre um, rationalist metaphysics in the Enlightenment era. It is not a coincidence, then, that the Ahrimanic degradation of this knowledge to the mathematically formalized laws of how the universe functions mechanistically as a massive machine had the political and ethical correlate of arguing that all social problems whatsoever ultimately stem from the same economic origins and can be solved through purely materialistic means. The result is, of course, a society that can only recognize the kind of pseudo-value which is that of practical usefulness, rather than any intrinsic, let alone any spiritual value. Ironically, the 20th century phenomenon of nationalism, specifically the ideal of a freedom for even the tiniest of all nations, is just another example of the Ahrimanic tendency towards strife, division, and materialistic reductivism. Even within particular nations, though, we see something of a microcosm of this nationalism in the problem of bitter partisan politics, in which each party's agenda can be rationalized and equally can convincing terms because the Ahrimanic sophistry works equally well in any direction it seems to be pushed. If you've ever wondered why both Republican and Democrat echo chambers in America sound equally convincing if you listen to nothing else except that. For example, if you spend all your time listening to um, AM talk radio shows like uh, that of NRA spokeswoman, former NRA spokeswoman Dana Lash, or if you listen to nothing except TYT, well, now you know why. It goes without saying that all of this partisan bickering does not occur in a vacuum, for whenever people fall for Ahriman's temptations, they unwittingly help pave the way for his incarnation, in the most literal sense of that term, to finally take place. Ironically, the people who do this the most, Steiner claims, 
are precisely the religious fundamentalists who insist on reading the sacred texts with the same sort of literalism which the scientific method uses. This is a misappropriation of the philosophy of materialism into the domain of spiritualism, which cannot help but lead people to adopt the Arimonic attitude even while trying to rebel against it. In the fourth lecture, you know that, once again, we can only really understand this ongoing evolution of man if we take account of Luciferian, Aramonic, and Christly influences as such. But at this point of the lecture series, he notes that, above all, this will allow you to realize that any call for a unified state, whether that be monarchy, democracy, communist state, whatever, this will also pave the way for the incarnation of Ariman, unless it is threefold in nature. Similarly, the superstition that one can understand social problems better through submitting them to the modern perversion of mathematical statistical analysis only fuels the greatest delusion of all, that the kind of quantification which disregards quality, which already um, is exactly what Ariman requires for his reincarnation, is that which can solve problems which have actually largely stemmed from that same Ariamonic attitude itself. Whereas today the Ariamonic largely dominates science, the Luciferic, he argues, as an excess, can be found in the retreat into religious dogmatism. For this reason, it is not at all an exaggeration to say that the ancient Greeks saw the world with different eyes than we have access to, since for them quantity was only one of some ten categories and not by far the most important or the most interesting one, whereas for us it is quite literally the only consideration which is worthy of the name at all. In fact, it is precisely the boredom of modern life which prepares the way for Ariman, in which everything seems so dry and tedious as the chore of having to pay one's taxes or understand one's mortgage or the workings of the stock market. This retreat into quantity does indeed breed the apathy which Ariman requires for his incarnation, and the solution must therefore be largely to make the world interesting and exciting once again. In the fifth lecture, Standard know that from this point we can say with certainty that as far as physical matter is concerned, the history of the Earth from here on will inevitably be an era of decline. In other words, ironically enough, progress is already over, specifically in the same physical realm in which it seems to be guaranteed to continue unfolding. This is not to say that all progress is ruled out in advance from occurring, however, for insofar as such a thing can occur, it will be only within the realm of spiritual development. Those who zealously reject the latter in order to force themselves to seek out satisfaction in the physical plane alone will never actually find it, as is all too evident in the phenomenon of the college student SJWs and wealthy but bored suburbanites, which are already ubiquitous within the West today. To fully understand this, we must revisit the mystery of Golgotha, but to understand this ancient event, we have to go back further still to the pre-Judeo-Christian pagan mindset. He notes that the cult of Mithras memorably featured an icon of the god riding a bull, symbolizing that while the bull below him belonged to the earth below, the god himself belonged to the cosmos above. This was a symbol for the ancient man's understanding that although he too belonged to the earthly realm during the waking hours, each night's dreams would transport him to that other cosmic realm in a way that was not dismissed at that time through the modern prejudices of something which is nothing more than a meaningless hallucination with purely physiological origins which you are actively inhibited from interpreting despite the fact that it's um, so naturally hermeneutically meaningful that you almost can't help but do so. Before any of the three incarnations took place, man's intellect, he knows, was largely receptive. It was in a state of dependence in which it had to receive knowledge only through the revelation of the mysteries, rather than be able to actively find it on its own. Then the Luciferic incarnation took place in China in the 3000s BC and changed all that. This figure, he notes, could use the intellect to actively find truth rather than have to passively accept it. Likewise, the irony 
is that the incarnation of Christ was widely recognized as the enormously significant event that it was, precisely because the Luciferian incarnation had already established the conditions for people to actively recognize such a thing in the first place. Similarly, what provides the conditions for the incarnation of Ariman today, except the same inventiveness on the physical plane, which has assumed the status of a religious value, that of course of technological innovation. Despite politically correct euphemisms, isn't the real end result of all this technological development just a pseudo-environment in which people binge on materialistic excesses to the point of falling into a state of manufactured drowsiness, which is exactly the same kind of state which Ariman requires us to be in, that is, a state particularly susceptible to domination and manipulation from an external force. Another thing which Ariman requires is that historically anomalous feature of modernity in which even learning itself, which was once considered the highest of all activities, to become just another me mechanistic, boring act which people go through the motions of doing simply as a requirement to advance their careers or to pick up a paycheck. Even teachers, you might have noticed, are so lacking in enthusiasm for their own subjects that they often go through the whole curriculum just for the money and robotically process all the information with no enthusiasm, let alone any on the part of their students. Another note of geographical importance, though, is that just as Lucifer was incarnated in the Far East, specifically in ancient China, and Christ was incarnated in the Middle East, Ariman will surely be incarnated in the West. While the incarnation is indeed inevitable, the consequences of it are not determined in advance. If we stay in this state of half-awareness, then they certainly will be very bad, but if we use the knowledge from these lectures, we can use the decline of the physical realm to ironically rise above it on a spiritual level. In the sixth lecture, he invites us to recall that in the ancient Hebrew tradition, it was well known that God was so far above man that he could not be approached directly. In fact, he could not even be named directly, but instead had to be approached through the angel Michael. It was only through Michael's mediation, therefore, that they could resist the pathological temptations on a political level to become just another state like any other, according to Steiner, which allowed that environment to host the incarnation of Christ himself later on. Interestingly, he claims that in the late 19th century, the mediation of Michael again became very important for man, but now is the mediator to Christ himself, rather than to Elohim, as would have been the case in the ancient world. Steiner therefore opens the closing lecture, that is the seventh one, with the warning that without accepting what we call anthroposophical spiritual science, civilization will inevitably sink into the abyss and the work incumbent upon the earth will then fall to divine powers whose further evolution will no longer be linked with human beings at all. Unfortunately, at the time this was said, the majority of people were far from accepting such ideas, and most of them were in fact in a half-awake state even when they were literally or nominally supposed to be awake. Most inaccessible to us in this state, of course, is precisely the underlying will, which he claims can only be grasped when it becomes idea that is contemplated by the intellect as such. It might surprise those who rarely get such a grasp of the will to realize that the will actually has a deep connection with the destructive forces of nature, rather than the mundane drives of reproduction and survival, so memorably dissected by Bronze Age pervert. This will only make sense if you realize that natural processes themselves simply cannot be explained as nothing more than a set of linearly determined causes and effects, for the true causes behind the events that materialize can only be unearthed through spiritual insight. Likewise, according to Steiner, evolution is the result of will in this very specific sense, not a mechanistic chain of causes begetting effects and so on. The era of dry logic and dialectic, which he does indeed call the Socratic age, has come to an end. Something different will characterize the future, for the science of the future must be the one that studies the will itself.
So now we're finally able to return to addressing the patron's question as such, and the first thing that maybe um, sticks out to me is the prediction by Steiner that the kind of technological monstrosities which would carry out the Arimonic project of domination, because let's remember from the lecture series, um, Lucifer is the tendency towards this sort of um, perverse liberation eventually ending up in a type of hallucination, which is actually so far uh, beyond this grounding in earthly reality that you actually simply fall into a, a, a delusion with no reference to anything beyond itself, if I understand him correctly. And the, um, the naive view would be that that is indeed what we have progressed to. We're always told that modernity is that liberation in this postmodernist sense of dissolving every archaic social fetishism from the past. We are not held down by, um, by religion or by gender or by caste or by village or by family or by race or whatever you fill in the blank with that, um, you know, the SJWs in the academic industry make a very comfortable living by um, just enumerating these one by one that we don't believe in that anymore. Okay, so we seem to have this liberation of a Luciferian kind, but the irony, according to um, Steiner, is that no, that Luciferian era was thousands of years ago. It really began in like, say, 5,000 BC, um, excuse me, 5,000 years ago with the incarnation of Lucifer in East China of all places. So, um, or I should say in the East in China. I don't know that it was literally within the Eastern part of China, but um, um, for the moment, we'll just uh, leave it at that. But th that's the irony of the situation, is we think that we've progressed to Luciferianism when Luciferianism was actually a very, very ancient phenomenon. What we have progressed to in the... Um, ironic sense that it's not really progress at all is, in fact, the exact exact opposite of that, which is the Arimonic domination. And what kind of people do you really need to have that type of a worldview, except people who really can't think for themselves? And this is, I think, what the patron maybe noticed as an interesting overlap between my own philosophy, say hermeneutical death, etc., specifically, um, and the same kind of thing which Steiner is maybe incidentally talking about, sort of arriving at through the occult emphasis on the, the sort of spiritual constitution of the um, demonic forces of Ariman as opposed to those of Lucifer. We often make the mistake of equating the term demonic with Luciferian. Well, that's kind of missing the point that the Luciferian and Arimonic are actually like polar opposites in the literal sense as we discussed in this um, lecture. So what kind of people does Ariman need to have the incarnation? except the exact same kinds of pseudo-subjects which the technological system needs. So it's really not a coincidence that these two overlap. And for this very reason, it no longer is really appropriate to even call them subjects, and certainly not to call them human subjects, because the whole point is kind of to go beyond that. And, you know, there are technophiles like even um, Jason Reza Jurjan who openly celebrate this post-humanism that um, technology inevitably tends towards. Um, one of the things that Georgiani also mentions as something like a prophetic fulfillment of the same sort of thing, which both um, Steiner um, saw coming and also um, Ernst Jünger mentioned in his novel The Glass Bees is the irony that um, the uh, project of technological automation will not be solved through the naive path of simply finding the perfect replica of the human subject. That's something which actually ended up um, leading to a lot of dead ends and wasted resources. Um, According to Giorgiani, when it was realized that the automation of human tasks was actually achieved much more efficiently by um, creating robots that had no need to be anthropomorphized. In other words, the original sort of worker robots were basically just um, carbon copies of us, but they realized that what you needed instead was the same sort of uh, micro robots um, that were envisioned in The Glass Bees. The interesting thing about The Glass Bees by Ernst Jünger is I'll discuss this book, obviously, um, you know, in a, in a whole, uh, in, in a, a book, uh, uh, the book in its entirety, I should say, I'll discuss at a later time. Um, the interesting thing that he um, envisioned at a, at a time way back in the past when nobody really could have imagined this would be the case, was that the, um, the robots in that book are 
you know, like he mentions the title, they're, they're little bees, okay? They're like insects, okay? They are not anthropomorphic androids. They um, actually solve the problem of meeting the needs of the global technological system, as this whole system, by the way, rather than a bundle of isolated machines, precisely by overcoming the things about humans that stand in the way of that project. In other words, humanity itself, and even more so, um, hermeneutical subjectivity is a technical problem problem. And the thing which technology inevitably does with technical problems is it solves them. And people like Ray Kurzweil are either incredibly naive on the issue or they're just flat out lying to you when they say that the technological system will make one exception to that general tendency. The one time it won't solve a problem is to keep you alive forever. Even after you've lost any usefulness, it will still have trillions of nanobots in your body to keep you in in a perpetual state of um, bliss by um, feeding you uh, pseudo experiences of all the junk food you could possibly want to eat and a perfect AI generated prostitutes and the experience of hard drugs without the consequences and all the other nonsense which Ray Kurzweil has become quite wealthy for selling to people who want to hear this because the alternative is simply too much to even begin to contemplate. So similarly, the patron mentions here that Steiner had a prediction that um, it would be spider-like beings rather than, once again, androids who, you know, in the early science fiction films, the early science fiction stories, whatever, um, are exactly like us, right? The um, Even in, say, um, Dragon Ball Z, if you remember the androids that they fight, um, they're so human-like that... Um, Krillin actually ends up marrying one of them, and many young guys who watched that show totally had a crush on Android 18. She was the attractive blonde robot who was not really supposed to be human, but we couldn't help but imagine her to be not just human, but, you know, kind of the most attractive kind, right? And this is the prejudice which um, it takes a mind like that of Steiner or younger to realize is something which is not at all to be reflected um, within the technological system itself. This is a, a prejudice with totally human origins. From the standpoint of the technological system, you would actually have to have something like an army of these spiders or bees, and to the extent that you have humans continue to exist, they can only be the kind of humans who have um, gone so far beyond losing the Luciferian freedom as to have the very perverse kind of freedom to do exactly what the system had already told them to do. It's kind of like a democracy in which there's there's one name on the ballot, so you, st you can technically vote, but there's only one name on the ballot, and that's basically what we had in 2020, right? Where the media said, well, there's 16 names on the ballot, whatever, Kanye West is one of them, Joe Jorgensen is one. Okay, but, you know, this election is mostly just being done for ceremonial purposes. We can already tell you in the month of May what the result's going to be, and um, we're not even going to allow the very possibility of any other outcome to be reported because you can vote, but there's basically only one name on the ballot. And that is really just a microcosm of the kind of freedom that you do have today on a college campus, for example. Um, you have to be so open-minded that you become closed-minded, as uh, one uh, video um, by a resident of San Francisco titled something like Why It Sucks to Live in San Francisco noted. He said something the effect of, well, you know, San Francisco is known nationwide traditionally for having the most open-minded people. In fact, they became so open-minded that they became totally closed-minded. There's only, you have the freedom to um, think uh, radical thoughts there, but only if they're the radical thoughts which the system already mandated that you think and uh, beyond that you really don't have any choice. So we have this um, illusion of Luciferian freedom characterizing modernity when in reality it's the exact opposite but you will not understand that as Steiner notes if, even if you remain within say the traditional even religious viewpoint of well there's just good and evil right there's just um, the, the, the forces of, say, Christ and then the forces of Satan. Even within traditional um, Christianity, this kind of misses the point that there's a difference between the 
equally demonic forces, but those which are not Luciferian, but rather Ariamonic. And the um, kinds of things which Ariamon <laughs> is actually characterized by just happen to overlap incredibly with the same technological system, which we mistakenly think is the uh, uh, the way of progressing beyond all such concerns with spiritual things as that, right? Um, and that is in something which is, in, I think, an incredibly useful insight um, as uh, put forth by Steiner. But in addition to this, to address it specifically with regard to the hermeneutical theory in my own sixth book, I think a lot more can be said about that as well. So as you recall from the argument in Hermeneutical Death, as well as my other works to a lesser extent, um, one of the things that you have in hermeneutical subjectivity is the ability to have different kinds of essences manifested. So there's a, a certain equivocation with being, which, um, you know, say Aristotle noticed in which, well, okay, we've got the being of, of material cause, but which element specifically? Is it earth, water, fire? And then, of course, Edmund Husserl took this further and said, well, no, all of those physical elements still belong to one type of being, which that is that of physical objects, but there's other types of being. The um, manifestation of, of, of uh, eternal laws uh, has a different way of appearing within consciousness. The uh, psychic acts have a different way. The purified region of consciousness itself has, has yet a different way. So those are all different types of being, which we miss if we simply use the word being to refer to all of them. I kind of adopt this in admittedly a very different and unusual way by saying, well, we have the um, being of uh, spirit, okay, we have the ability to have spiritual truths manifest within mythology, for example, in Hindu mythology, the spiritual insight that um, creation and destruction cannot be so readily separated is manifested in the myth of uh, the great mother who needed one of the three great gods to um, perform incest with her to have more creation take place, and Contrary to expectation, it was not the god of creation, Brahma, not the god of preservation, Vishnu, but rather the god of destruction, Shiva, who agreed to do this with her. So that's a way of expressing an incredibly complicated and difficult spiritual insight about creation and destruction in a way that anybody could understand, and that is the point of mythology. Okay, And this is exactly what you lose when you have this uh, hermeneutical death in which it's no longer possible. With modern technology, you no longer have access to the five regions of a spirit and then the Gnostic region where you actually grasp uh, numerical truths through some mathematical system, but also the grammatical universals and the truths of logic, as I recommend you to check out my books for more information on that. Um, you have these systems within the past in, say, Euclidean geometry or the ancient Indian um, uh, arithmetic, etc. You have these systems that actually allow you to access this other type of being, which that is that of the Gnostic systematic values. Um, but ironically, you lose that with modern technology because now you no longer care about accessing those. You're simply um, uh, providing the illusion of mathematical uh, certainty when you're really just moving around redundant um, states of electronic energy, as I've noted in my book. So you have this tendency to lose access to spirit, to number, to um, to sense objects, um, to the disclosure of the human body itself, to the mind, and even to ecological context. There is no ecological context, no underlying soma, contrary to expectation within modern technology, not even the soma of fossil fuels. It somehow oversteps even that. So you have this characteristic of uh, modern technology that you no longer have hermeneutics because you no longer have the spirit appear. But wait a minute, I thought Steiner said that modern technology itself simply is the way for the um, the spiritual forces of Ariman to pave the way for his incarnation by estab by by actually having um, this domination established in accord with that particular spiritual tendency as opposed to the spiritual tendency of Lucifer. So isn't this kind of, on a naive level, a contradiction or a problem? Well, not really. You can have that going on, but that does not mean that it will be registered by the human subject, especially if one no longer exists. The point of the hermeneutical death is not that spirit and number and ecological context are no longer there. It's rather that you no longer have a subject who's at home to see them. And that's exactly what's going on, I think, with Ariman to an extent which even I did not um, 
explained fully within my past work, and I think I will certainly incorporate this into my future writing. You have this irony that you have um, Ariman um, and such spiritual forces carrying out this work for the technological system, just as the technological system is making it impossible for anyone to see that that is the case. And that is exactly what Steiner mentions. He says the irony is materialism is not overcoming all spiritual forces. It is exactly the result of the spiritual forces, but of Ariman, which only becomes stronger through this sort of manufactured state of ignorance and quote unquote blindness with regard to those same spiritual forces. Okay. So that is what makes the situation so complicated, but what makes this particular revelation by Steiner um, and, of course, the discussion which this patron brought up so incredibly um, uh, enlightening, I think, with regard to this discussion which has been going on within the school for the past year. So I invite all of the patrons to join in and mention what they think about this, and we will be discussing it both within the comments section here and also within the uh, Discord itself. And remember, if you haven't joined the school, it's only $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the description.